In this chapter, we will learn about metal extrusion and drawing processes and equipment. So what are the objectives in this chapter? Uh, we're going to learn about extrusion and drawing. These processes involve pushing or pulling of a material through a die for the purpose of modifying its cross-section. We're going to take a look at different types of extrusion processes and we're going to define the extrusion force, how it depends on material and processing parameters. We're going to take a look at hot and cold extrusion. We're going to look at extrusion practices, die designs, and the defects that can be present in extruded products. And we're going to look at the same in a similar manner, we're going to look at the process of drawing. What are the defects? What are the practices? And what are the die considerations, etc. So, extrusion is simply where you have a cylindrical billet that is forced through a die. In the same way you would squeeze a toothpaste from a tube. Uh, you can uh, modify the cross sections. They can be solid or hollow. Extruded products um, usually remain their uh, cross section along their length and large deformations uh, take place without fracture. Typical products made by extrusion can be railings for sliding doors, window or door frames, tubing, aluminum leather frames, structural architectural shapes, and you can also cut these products into desired lengths and make them discrete parts. Commonly um, extruded materials are aluminum, copper, steel, magnesium, and lead. It is because, as we said, large deformations have to take place without fracture, so it is easier to extrude materials that has uh, high ductility. There, there is possibility of uh, extruding other materials. Um, some metals, some alloys, uh, but it, there can be some difficulty to them. Depending on the ductility of the material, the process can be carried out at room uh, or at elevated temperatures. Because remember, some materials may be not very ductile at room temperature, therefore heating them up will uh, give us some ductility so it is easier to shape the material that way like titanium for example if we want to extrude titanium we need to work at elevated temperatures there are three basic types of extrusion indirect uh, direct and hydrostatic extrusion processes In the direct extrusion, a billet is placed in a container, also called chamber, and forced through a die. Here is your die, and the material is forced through it. And here is the direction of extrusion, right? And there is the rem applying the force and pushing it through the die cavity. So the die opening as we said can be round or it can have different shapes which type of the cross section shape you desire depending on that the die can have die opening can have various shapes. There is also the dummy block here we are seeing 
and the function of it is to protect the tip of the pressing stem or rem okay because uh, especially this is true for hot extrusion we don't want to damage because damage the tip of the rem uh, because we're going to constantly use it and this dummy block will prevent and it is easier if there is some damage it is easier to replace the dummy block than replacing the rem you are seeing in this image uh, examples of products made by extrusion and we are seeing different cross sections so we covered uh, the direct or it is also called forward extrusion now let's look at indirect extrusion or this is also called reverse inverted or backward extrusion this in this case the die moves toward the stationary billet in the previous one uh, the billet was forced uh, through the die cavity but in this case the die is moving towards the stationary billet so the advantage of this is you don't have billet container friction basically because the billet doesn't move what moves is the die so since there is no relative motion you can uh, extrude materials with high friction such as high strength steels so in image A we are seeing this indirect extrusion where the billet is stationary but the die moves towards the billet and extruding the part another type is hydrostatic in this case the billet is smaller in diameter than the container and the container is filled with the fluid so when the rem is uh, applies the force this force is transmitted to the fluid by a rem and then because there is a fluid this fluid imparts tri triaxial compressive stresses on the billet so in all three dimensions the compressive stresses are applied on the billet of course this will improve the formability of the part and with the presence of the fluid there is less workpiece container friction in compared to the direct extrusion here you are seeing an example of the hydrostatic extrusion you see the f there is the fluid here right there is your rem and pushing applying force to the fluid fluid is applying triaxial compression stresses and all over the in all di dimensions applying stresses on the part and pushing it this type of configuration basically eliminates the friction uh, between the workpiece and the container uh, a less common type of extrusion is lateral extrusion side extrusion this is shown in the image C as you can see there is the punch applying force to your part and it comes out in a uh, vertical direction and uh, it's uh, suitable for uh, usually low melting point materials
here the direct extrusion process is illustrated and we can see the process variables in this figure so there is the die angle you see the alpha and there is reduction in cross-section going from A0 to AF so initial area to final area extrusion speed, billet temperature and lubrication these all affect uh, the extrusion process so the die angle is alpha extrusion uh, ratio R is defined as the ratio of the cross-sectional area of the billet to that of the extruded part. We said temperature, speed of rem and lubrication, friction and the strength of the material. All those are going to affect the extrusion process. And uh, what is the extrusion force? What does it depend on? If we think about logically what is the how the force will change it will depend on first of all the strength of the material right and we that's why we said some materials are extruded much more easily than other ones and the extrusion ratio what is the cross-section area reduction that you want to achieve the R and also it depends on be the friction between the billet and the container and die surfaces because if there is a high friction then you need to apply uh, forces against to overcome the friction also and other processing variables like temperature speed of the ram etc so all these will affect the force Extrusion force is defined as in the equation you are seeing, which is A0 times K times Ln A0 over AF. So K here is the extrusion constant, which is defined, which is figured out experimentally. And it depends on the material strength and frictional conditions. And the other ones, you know, the initial cross-sectional area and final cross-sectional area. So how do we find K experimentally? So from the force equation, from the value of the known force and cross-sectional areas, one can determine the extrusion constant uh, for different types of uh, materials so in this figure we are given those experimental results what are the extrusion constants for different types of materials and we are also seeing that the K the extrusion constant depends on the temperature so with temperature uh, it's gonna change right and I, I'm seeing here with increasing temperature the K is decreasing that also tells you with increasing temperature the force that you need to apply is also decreasing the metal flow pattern in extrusion it is very important because it has an influence on the quality and final properties of the product Material flows longitudinally, uh, therefore extruded products have an elongated grain structure. Improper metal flow uh, can produce defects in extrusion. And one way to investigate the flow pattern is to cut the billet lengthwise into half and mark one face with a square grid pattern and then put together these two halves and then place it in the chamber and then extrude and then analyze this extrusion uh, flow pattern and here's some images of the typical flow patterns obtained with this technique Here we are 
are seeing the metal flow patterns in extruding with square dies. And in the first image, image A, we see the flow pattern obtained at low friction in or in indirect extrusion. So because indirect extrusion, remember, had low friction, right? And in image B, we are seeing if there is a high friction at the billet and chamber interfaces, you see a dead metal zone. That zone is observed where the metal at the corners essentially remains stationary. In image C, uh, it is a pattern that is observed either at high friction or with cooling of the outer regions of the hot bullet in the chamber. So because there is cooling or there is high friction, uh, which ha what happens is the metal strength increases with the decreasing temperature because when in contact with the cold surfaces in hot extrusion, this will create an increase in the friction also. So this type of flow pattern will lead to a defect known as pipe or extrusion defect. Pipe, uh, piping defect is like a sinkhole at the end of the billet under direct extrusion. Like this. Okay, so um, next is, let's look at processing parameters. So the extrusion ratio uh, usually in between 10 to 100. Remember R, what's A not over AF. Okay, so that is usually between 10 and 100. And the workpiece is usually less than 7.5 meter long because it is difficult to handle greater lengths. And the ram speeds can range, uh, can be up to 0.5 meter per second. So lower speeds are preferred for aluminum, magnesium, copper and higher speeds preferred for steel, titanium and other refractory uh, alloys. We have talked that aluminum, copper, magnesium and their alloys because of their high ductility uh, compared to like titanium, refractory metals, they can be uh, extruded relatively uh, easily. And metals such as titanium and refractory metals, they can also be extruded, but there is some difficulties, such as there, there can be dye wear in Also, uh, the, you know, there's a die angle and that causes a small portion at the end of the billet to remain in the chamber. And this portion is called scrap or butt end. This is later removed by cutting it off. Uh, one can also place uh, another billet at the end so this way uh, this cutting off step can be eliminated for metals and alloys where they don't have sufficient ductility at room temperature and of course we need to reduce the forces because this economically affects the process, the amount of force we need to apply, right? So in order to reduce the forces, extrusion is usually carried out at elevated temperatures. But because there are 
there is high operating temperature, there are some problems such as the dye wear can be excessive. When the billet is hot and the container is cold, of course this will result in non-uniform deformation because the surfaces are cooling much faster than the inner regions. And as always the problem with the heat, uh, there will be an oxide layer forming on the on the part and this is gonna because the oxides are abrasive this can of course damage the dye what can be done to prevent the formation of oxide film on the billet is maybe do it in an inert environment to form to prevent the formation of these oxides and because these are hard and abrasive, they will affect the flow pattern. And it will not provide you a good surface finish. In this table, we are given the typical uh, extrusion temperature, temperature ranges for metals and alloys. And you can see that for steels and refractory alloys uh, we need to increase the temperature to a very high volume in order to be able to extrude them so the dive design of course requires a considerable experience Square dies are used for extruding non-ferrous metals like aluminum and you see that in image A uh, the shape of die that is used for aluminum and non-ferrous metals it's a, this first one is the square dies and these, these dies develop uh, dead metal zones and if you provide an angle, uh, uh, like the die angle, like in the image B, that is more suitable for non-ferrous -fer metals, ferrous metals. And in the image C, you are seeing a T-shaped extrusion made by made of hot work die steel. So in a, another type of die design where we have, we want to have a tube uh, structure extruded. So how do we do it? We call it tubing. In that case, uh, initially you can start with a solid or hollow billet. And the wall thickness that can be achieved is limited to one millimeter for aluminum three millimeter for carbon steels and five millimeter for stainless steels as you can see as the ductility of the material is increasing you can go to a much more thinner uh, thickness wall thickness volumes how you can form a tubular structure you can um, fit the ram with a mandrel and which pierces a hole into the bullet and you can see that in this image here so there is your rem and there is your ma mandrel here which gives the bullet a solid bullet a tube shape also you can do extrusion with billets that has a pierced hole previously but uh, due to the friction and severity of the deformations thin wall extrusions are difficult to produce compared to those of thick walls okay How cross sections can be 
extruded uh, using for example special dyes such as spider dye, bridge dye. What happens here is the metal divides and flows around the support for the internal mandrel into stra strands and then those strands uh, which are extruded become re-welded before they exit the die. This is suitable for aluminum and its alloys because they can develop strong weld under pressure. And lubricants cannot be used also because they will prevent the re-welding of the metal. So if you take a look at the image here, here is the rim and your billet here with the blue, right? There is a mandrel that is put in here, which is representing this is the spider die. There is the mandrel and the material is forced through uh, that mandrel. Um, and to form that uh, hollow cross section but after it passes through that spider die what has to happen is it, it's gonna those strands that are separated right they gonna get re-welded before they exit the die in this figure in image A we are seeing um, an extruded aluminum leather lock for uh, aluminum uh, leathers as you can see it was cut from an extrusion and in image B, C, D we are seeing special dies and how the part will look like after it was extruded and flow through that special dies and then we weld it you are seeing these are the shape of the dies and after it exits the die it's it's being re-welded under the high pressure in the welding chamber before they exit so they, this is how they're gonna look like of course this it will require a lot of consideration to figure out what the final cross section is gonna be it requires a lot of consideration design and and out of experience cold extrusion is used widely for components in autom automobiles motorcycles bicycles appliances and in transform transportation and agricultural equipment compared to hot uh, extrusion Cold extrusion has advantages such as improved mechanical properties, improved surface finish. So remember cold working at room temperature when we try to deform the part, its in strength is increasing. So improved mechanical properties come from the fact the grain structure, the structure is changed inside. And improved surface finish compared to hot uh, extrusion is due to the formation not for the formation of the oxide layers because oxide layers only form in hot extrusion and therefore cold extrusion provides us a better surface finish eliminate the need for additional surface finishing operations um, however of course due to the fact that uh, at cold temperatures the material will require higher stress levels to be able to be shaped. So stress magnitudes on tools will gonna be higher compared to hot extrusion. Of course that causes uh, wear in the dies. Therefore they should possess uh, sufficient strength, high toughness, resistance to wear and fatigue failure in order to be able to handle the forces, stresses in 
cold extrusion. And lubrication is of course critical, especially with steels. Because of the possibility of sticking between the workpiece and tooling. Here we are seeing two examples of cold extrusion and in this case the arrows indicate the direction of metal flow during the extrusion. Impact extrusion is all considered uh, in the uh, cold extrusion category. There is a punch that descends rapidly on the workpiece, uh, which is extruded backwards, like this one. So again, don't forget to watch the videos because you can see this process visually and it will make more sense if you actually see the process. Here is the link also. So here it was illustrated for us the impact extrusion process. There is the punch, there is the blank, the workpiece and the die holding the blank and the bl punch descends rapidly on the blank. And because the volume has to stay the same, uh, the part will start to flow uh, outwards, basically, in this direction. So this way you can create tubular uh, shapes. There is the image of an impact impact extrusion for for a collapsible tube. Collapsible tube. Think about it as uh, the toothpaste tubes. So in this case, you are seeing that there is the punch blank and punch descends. For me, the workpiece raises. Uh, towards upward and forming the tubular shape and this is how it looks like at the end right what type of defects are uh, observed in extrusion process and we observe cracks surface defects if the temperature, friction, and speed these are too high, uh, this might cause surface cracking or tearing. And such defects can occur in aluminum, magnesium, and zinc alloys, which can be minimized by lowering the billet temperature and extrusion speed. There are other surface defects, such as what we call bamboo defects that can happen at low temperatures. This is due to the sticking of the extruded part. Um, on the die surface. Another defect we also talked about was pipe. Due to the flow pattern of uh, that is observed in extrusion that type of flow pattern draw oxides impurities towards the center of the billet and this will create a pipe defect this can be minimized if the flow pattern is modified to be more uniform such as controlling the friction minimizing the temperature gradients within the part
Another type of defect is internal cracking. This is also called chevron cracking. So this crack forms due to the tensile stresses at the center line in the formation zone. It is similar to the necking, neck, necking region that forms in a tensile test specimen. So. If you look at it here, this is how chevron cracking is observed in the parts. And this is how it forms. So this is similar to necking forming here. And this necking process will cause uh, stresses to concentrate and might lead to the formation of uh, cracks as it it calls in the plastic deformation of the uh, under tension stress right so that's similar to that and this is called basically uh, chevron cracking so this was another type of defect tendency for this type of cracking increases with increasing die angle and increases uh, with increasing amount of impurities. Remember in necking uh, uh, impurities are the places where the void starts to form and then uh, coalesce and then material uh, cracks, right? So the increasing amount of uh, impurities will also increase this type of cracking. It will decrease with increasing extrusion ratio and friction. Let's take a look at a uh, drawing process. In drawing process, the cross section of a rod or wire is reduced or changed in shape by pulling it through a die. There can be round and or non-round profiles. And applications uh, range from uh, blanks for bolts and rivets, electrical wiring, cables, welding electrode, paper clips, springs, spokes for bicycle wheels, stringed musical instruments. What are the variables in this process? First, reduction in cross-sectional area, die angle, friction, drawing force, and the force similar to extrusion is given with this equation. It depends on the stress of the strength of the material and again the reduction in cross-sectional area and maximum uh, reduction in cross-sectional area with this process can be obtained is 63 percent there are more detailed equations for force in your book that includes the effect of friction and uh, the angle so you can also check that out what we can say based on these force equations given we can say that as friction increases uh, the force is increasing because this is by logic you can say you need to apply more forces to overcome friction. Also, uh, the drawing force increases as reduction increases. From the equations given for the force, one can also calculate 
for a certain value of reduction and frictional conditions, there can be an optimum die angle which will provide the minimum drawing force. The image is given to us for drawing process. As you can see, this is similar to extrusion. The only difference here is we are pulling the mate material. That's it. There is again a die angle, uh, initial and final cross-sectional cross areas as process parameters. Drawing of other shapes possible is in similar to the extrusion mandrels can be used for internal cavities. Initial cross sections are usually uh, round or square and wedge shaped dies are used for drawing flat strips. This process is also called ironing and used in making aluminum beverage cans. Uh, uh, annealing must can be necessary because remember we need to keep the ductility at a certain level to be able to uh, shape the part with extrusion or drawing. Drawing speeds, this depends on the material and the reduction in cross-sectional area may range from 1 to 50 meter per second. Uh, 5 to 50 meter per second for very fine wire, for example, the ones used for electromagnets. But you need to be careful because when you do uh, fast drawing, uh, this material doesn't have sufficient time to dissipate the heat generated during the drawing and their increase in temperatures can have detrimental effects on the product quality such as surface finish, dimensional tolerances. A light reduction uh, known as seizing pa sizing pass can be done on rods to improve their surface finish and dimensional accuracy. So because a light reduction will only deform the surface layers, it, will pro it can provide better surface finish. One technique to improve productivity is to draw several wires simultaneously as a bundle. So this is achieved by using a material uh, as an interface, is keeping the interfaces of these wires separate from each other, but can be uh, leached out from the drawn wire surfaces when the when it's done, when the drawing is done. Uh, die angles uh, ranges from 6 to 15. There are two types of angles. One is approach angle and the other one is actually relief angle. Basic design has been developed through trial and error and the land gives the final dimension of the product. Dye materials uh, can be tool steels, diamonds, diamonds especially for drawing a fine wire. So let's take a look at it. Here is some tube drawing operations where there, there can be used with without an internal mandrel as you see in A or you can use mandrel, stationary, floating, or a moving mandrel to uh, have a tube-shaped part. And here is the entering angle, here is the back relief angle. So back relief means, so you need to, you're removing actually excess friction that, that is more than necessary. 
So there is the relief angle, there is the entering angle and approach angle, and there is the bearing surface we call the land. Lubrication is essential to improve the dye life and surface finish and also to reduce drawing forces. What type of lubrication uh, in uh, drawing we have? Okay, one is wet drawing. The dyes and the rod are immersed completely in the lubricant. And there is dry drawing. Uh, the surface of the rod uh, coated with a lubricant by passing it through a boxed field of lubricant which is called stuffing box and there is metal coating the rod is coated with a soft metal such as copper, tin which also acts as a lubricant and there is ultrasonic vibration of dyes and mandrels which improve the surface finish die life and reduce drawing forces thus allowing higher reductions per pass without failure what type of defects are observed in drawing those are similar to what we observe in extrusion especially the center cracking we have seen another type of defect is seams these are longitudinal folds in the drawn product it is bad because these seams can later open up if there is subsequent forming operations such as upsetting heading rolling or bending and this will cause uh, serious problems Because there is a non-uniform deformation during drawing, this will create residual stresses inside the material. If a layer has to be removed with machining or grinding, this might cause uh, warping in the part. In summary, we learned about extrusion and drawing. Uh, what, what is extrusion? What is drawing? What are the factors affecting dye design or what are the uh, parameters that are affecting the process in both extrusion and drawing? And what type of defects we observe in both uh, process? And basically how we can improve uh, the process in a way to eliminate the formation of defects and reduce the applied forces.